begin by um, acknowledging the um, original owners of the land on which I'm speaking tonight, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, and welcome everybody again to this is our second Labour History Looking Ahead After 60 Years seminar. Um, we have a New Zealand flavour tonight. Um, unfortunately, uh, Angela Wanhala had to um, withdraw at the last minute, but we are very fortunate that Sibel Locke has, um, was able to step in and we're very grateful, Sibel, for your doing that. Sibel is a, a senior lecturer in history at the Victoria University of Wellington. She has written on Maori um, radicalism and uh, anti-racism in New Zealand unions and serves on the editorial group as um, our New Zealand representative. New Zealand has always been a very important part of um, labour history and was as from the beginning of the society uh, regarded as an important dimension of labour history. So we're very glad to have you, Sibel. And thank you for stepping in. And our second speaker will be Michael Pearson, who has recently completed his PhD at um, Australian Catholic University here in Australia on motor mechanics, masculinity, class, gender, labour process, and Australia in the base in the 20th century. So we're really looking forward to hearing what Michael has to say. Um, as you know, that the uh, th this seminar series is to showcase the work that we're doing on the Journal of Labour History, and everybody who is giving a paper is has published or is publishing with us um, in in coming issues. So both Michael and Sabel have done that most recently. So um, without any further ado from me, I'll hand over to um, Sabel who'll uh, lead us off with oral history and intersectional approaches to labour history in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you. Kia ora, Diane. <laughs> Kia ora, Tato. Um, really lovely um, to have you all here uh, listening in. And um, yeah, my acknowledgements to those of you who organised this event this evening. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, mana whenua of the lands upon which I stand, uh, Kia te awa, me taranaki whanui uh, kai tai atu ki ngati tō rangatira. Uh, and I also wish to pay my respects to uh, the traditional custodians of the land where many of you sit uh, and pay my respects to Indigenous elders, uh, past, present and emerging. So um, as Diane said, um, this was a little bit of a last minute. Um, but um, I'm, I'm basing it on some on some thinking I did that um, when Diane and Kirkby asked me for my thoughts for a, a Scottish tradition um, reflection on the state of um, New Zealand um, labour history, and so I'm kind of riffing off that tonight. And so, uh, just to be really aware that it, it's a, I guess I wanted to front centre it that it's a personal perspective. Um, yeah, but that'll become clearer as I go through. In 1990, the Trade Union History Project organised for Antipodean historians to come together and discuss the connections between labour culture and the working classes. In a publication that followed culture in the labour movement, Johnny Martin and Kerry Taylor reflected on the state of New Zealand labour history. They acknowledged it had to share to some extent in the flourishing of social history, but was still institutionally and organisationally focused. Labour history work predominantly centered on the arbitration system, trade unions and labor councils, and the political expression of the labor movement and the labor party, centered on the most militant class conscious trade union moments of history from the 1890 Australasian maritime strike to the wave of strikes uh, spearheaded by the red fed socialist and syndicalist working class, uh, predominantly men, um, and before the turn to politics and the formation of the labor party. Now, Martin and, and Taylor looked forward from 1991 and expressed their hope that the establishment of the Trade Union History Project in 1987, devoted to the recording and preservation of relevant material and to the publication of labor history, would encourage labor history beyond its existing confines to new historical subjects. 
women, Māori, immigrants, non-unionised groups and the rank and file in the unions. Oral history was strongly encouraged to produce new histories from below that engaged oppositional cultural forms, labour process theory and challenged the very concept of work. The lens should be widened from industrial male workers to agricultural or seasonal work, part-time and casual work, contract work, voluntary work, domestic and other forms of unpaid labour. Um, and this is the contents page, uh, some of uh, you may recognise um, from, this, from this collection um, that I want to be kind of drawing trajectories from today. So as Martin and Tehela hoped, uh, new directions in labour history were seeded. Uh, I want to focus on how oral history has become a key source uh, and labour history has become increasingly in intersected with welfare, gender, Māori and radical history. In 1994, Lufi Taxa wrote, study of working class culture by Australian labour historians has been fundamentally, albeit indirectly influenced by the use of oral history. I argue here that the same can be said for New Zealand labour historians. Anna Green was an oral history trailblazer uh, doing her 1980s PhD research. Uh, she interviewed 40 wood waterside workers and unpacked their workplace cultures between 1915 and 1951. Her chapter in Culture and the Labour Movement explored what nicknames could tell us about male working class culture. And as a teacher and a scholar, she made space for oral history in the academy in the early 2000s while remaining strongly connected to public historians through the National Oral History Association of New Zealand formed in 1986 with the fabulous uh, acronym No Hands. No Hands offered uh, training workshops and organised biennial conferences, uh, publishing an annual uh, journal, Oral History in New Zealand from 1988, edited by Megan Hutching. In publications with Hutching, Anna Green challenged academia to take oral history theory and practice seriously. Uh, and she trained the, the next generation of oral history scholars. Among them, uh, was Nipia Mahuika, now an internationally renowned uh, Māori scholar, particularly for his very recent work, Rethinking Oral History and Tradition and Indigenous Perspective. Um, this collection in the middle there, Māori and Oral History, um, is all of the, the Māori Oral History collection um, articles that were, had been published in the Oral History Journal had, were brought together in this collection and published. Thanks to a one million gift well, a gift from Australia, thank you all, to recognise New Zealand's uh, sesquicentennial in 1990, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage established a fund uh, to be used to record uh, oral history of New Zealand peoples and grants have been distributed annually since 1991. So for 30 years once uh, conducted, these community oral histories have been deposited in the Alexander Turnbull Library. Uh, many of them relate uh, to the lives of working class people and they're rich sources for oral historians. I want to particularly draw your attention to um, Auckland Unemployed Workers Rights Centre member Karen Davis's project. She won an award in 1992 to interview members of Turoku Rawakore or Aotearoa, the National Unemployed and Beneficiaries Movement. The Trade Union History Project began recording their events and conferences which also de deposited in the National Library. And in 1997, uh, Commission Sean Ryan to interview 30 retired trade union leaders. And when it was discovered that 29 of those uh, interviewees were, with, were men, a further grant enabled Ryan to conduct 10 interviews with trade union women. Now the context for producing labor history changed dramatically from 1991. Uh, as unemployment reached the highest level since the Great Depression, the national government made substantial cuts uh, to unemployment and other welfare benefits and dismantled the arbitration system that had supported trade unionism in New Zealand since 1894. The trade union movement went into sharp decline uh, with the unions strapped for cash, less labor history was produced. Peter Franks who wrote about the origins of female dominated clerical workers union in 1991 next focused on their demise in 1992. Pat Walsh and Melanie Nolan turned their attention to the history of the arbitration system, a system fast disappearing. I got involved with the Auckland Unemployed Workers Rights Centre as an undergrad, uh, and with their encouragement, I decided to study the organised unemployed in my doctoral research beginning in 1996. I quickly discovered the dearth um, of New Zealand scholarship uh, on the organised unemployed 
Um, the little there was was focused on the 1890s and 1930s, uh, much of it on the Pākehā urban unemployed. Um, I was pleased to discover uh, the beat of weary feet uh, and standing the wattle. Uh, that was a welcome find, I remember. So the lumpen proletariat, while steeply embedded in class relations, uh, appeared to be New Zealand neighbour history's poor cousin. Uh, oral history sources, those uh, conducted by Karen Davis that I talked about, shaped my approach to exploring the formation of unemployed groups in the national movement in the 1980s. 1980s organisers um, of the unemployed looked to the past, uh, the 1930s Great Depression, in both critical and celebratory ways uh, to inform their activism in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And this is what informed my decision to compare those two decades in my PhD thesis. I drew on Alan Hawkins' Labour and Culture Map in the Field, um, that chapter in, in Culture and the Labour Movement, to explore how 1980s activists celebrated the community spirit of 1930s protest, protest while deconstructing uh, the male working class hero. Research revealed half the members of the 1980s National Unemployed and Beneficiaries Movement were Māori and the bicultural structure was established to share organisational power between Māori and non-Māori. However, few Māori activists um, had been recorded. They set out to do this work uh, with absolutely no training. Um, sadly, Anna Green wasn't yet um, running her courses. Um, yeah, so I learned very much by doing. Um, interviewees didn't just narrate their pasts, I learned. They interpreted, historicized, made meaning of their past selves. So I decided to position my thesis on the boundary of labor history and Māori history with a theoretical lens um, of class, uh, race and gender. <clears throat> Evelyn Higginbotham's 1996 article, African-American Women's History and the Metal Language of Race was an important frame for me for reading class and gender through race. Any historical understanding of Māori unemployment had to begin with the impact of colonialism, I argued. Māori and Pākehā protest traditions, collective identities and goals were explored separately uh, in the 1930s, living in two different geographic spaces, and then together with the formation of a bicultural unemployed movement in the 80s. Women played leadership roles in unemployed movements in both decades, uh, but gender was not as central as race and class uh, to my thinking, as it has been for other labour historians. Culture and the Labour Movement, Ray Francis' chapter writing um, a gendered labour history defended the social history of the working class approach as that most able to encompass the heterogeneity of labour experiences on the family and community. Uh, kia ora, Ray. Uh, Francis and Bruce Gates edited volume Women, Work in the Labour Movement in Australia and New Zealand, uh, which also came out in 1991, encouraged a trend towards gendered labour history amongst New Zealand historians. Historians have built a database of working class Dunedin focused largely on the handicrafts trades between the 1880s and 1920s. In the 1990s, a gendered lens was applied to the project. Uh, Joan Scott's challenges of E.P. Thompson were taken seriously. And oral interviews were conducted uh, to address the difficulties of locating women in statistical data. In 2003, Sites of Gender, uh, Women, Men and Modernity in Southern Dunedin was published. It traced the intersections and divergences between gender and class in those working class suburbs of Dunedin. And Eric Olson's chapter, Working Gender, Gendering Work, became a key text in my labor history classes. <clears throat> Melanie Nolan became the leading gender and labor scholar in New Zealand. She produced Breadwinning, New Zealand Women in the State, a majestic account of the interplay between women's domesticity and wage earning and the rise and fall of the male breadwinner wage system from the 1870s through to the 1970s. Nolan revealed uh, familial working class subcultures and his study of Christchurch workers representative, Jack McCulloch and recovered women's experiences of the 1913 great strike uh, and the 1951 waterfront lockout. This uh, latter work, um, the big blue was supported by the 2001 trade union history project commemoration uh, of that dispute. At the end of the 2000s, PhD student um, Grace Miller drew on oral histories with women to examine the family economy of the 1951 waterfront dispute and broke new historical ground. 
Although feminist and gender historians have pushed labor historians to recover the roles of women, the focus was largely on women who bucked traditional gendered norms and was quite often gender segregated. Very few scholars had paid attention to women's domestic work uh, during strikes and lockouts and Bruce Gates's gender household and community politics. The 1890 maritime strike in Australia and New Zealand was one of the few. So Gates' analysis was influential uh, for Miller's work and also for my own research uh, on women. I called them rebel girls and pram pushing scab hunters who stood up to uh, run the Waihi strike in 1912 when their men folk were jailed. Very recently, um, in uh, 2019, we have Barbara Brooks, Jane McCabe, and Angela Wanhala's uh, Women, Work, and Emotion, and then hot off the press as a matter of like, what is it, Grace? Two weeks ago, we have Women Will Rise, Recalling the Working Woman's Charter, edited by Gay Simpkin and Marie Russell, um, and supported by Grace Miller after um, great Gay Simpkin passed away, um, to explore um, from different perspectives the Working Woman's Charter, uh, written in 1977. So it should be argued, I can definitely argue that gendered labour history is alive and well in Aotearoa, New Zealand. New Zealand radical history has always intersected sharply uh, with labour history. Kerry Taylor traced the trajectories from socialism, syndicalism to the Communist Party of New Zealand in his thesis work. And then later Jared Davidson recovered anarchist thought and activity in the early 20th century and embedded New Zealand anarchism in transnational networks. Maureen Birchfield employed oral history to write biographies of communist women, her mother, Connie Birchfield and Elsie Locke. Kerry Taylor's and Pat Maloney's edited collection on the left uh, essays on socialism in New Zealand traced the history of the left from the Knights of Labour through to the post-war uh, New Left exam examined by Toby Borrowman and ending with a chapter I wrote uh, from my thesis which was just completed uh, on the, the leaders of the 1980s unemployed movement and, and how the women's liberation, communist and Māori sovereignty movements had impacted them. What I think was um, startling about, uh, about this book is that there was no chapter directly on the trade union movement, um, although of course it appeared as a backdrop uh, to many chapters. In the 2000s, New Zealand labor history works were finally beginning to traverse the post-World War II decades, but there was no real consideration yet of marginalized workers, women, Māori and Pacific peoples, uh, the underclass as Melanie Nolan called them in this article here and their experiences of the 1950s and 1960s economic boom and the way it gave way uh, to the long depression between 1974 and 1994. And so this is what I aim to do when I turn my thesis into a book, Workers in the Margins, and, and which was uh, eventually published in 2012. Wove together three case studies of working class unions, male dominated freezing workers, female dominated clerical workers and their peak bodies, the Federation of Labour and Council of Trade Unions, as well as unemployed workers unions and their peak body, Te Rōpū Rābākori or Aotearoa. So oral history was again crucial uh, in revealing the role that women and Māori played in changing the shape and culture of their unions. I drew heavily on Sean Ryan's interviews with trade union leaders. I argued workers in the margins sat between new and old labour history. Inspired by E.P. Thompson, it tells the story of those who were described as casualties of history. I write about freezing workers made obsolete, casualised clerical workers, temporary employment scheme workers, the newly unemployed and their struggles to maintain unions in the face of enormous economic change. But it has much in common with old style labour history, placing union radicals in the context of their unions. It was at the end of this process I began thinking more about positionality, and this wasn't very much informed by Māori scholars. Māori historians have become increasingly influential, establishing a collective to Pohiri Kōrero and publishing a journal of the same name. Aroha Harris's work on Whakapapa's historical method prompted my thinking about positionality as a Pahia historian and writing labor history. Bringing together um, many oral histories, Melissa Matatina Williams traces how new Māori migrants to Auckland city dominated particular workplaces and Māori cultural practices became the norm in those places in the 1950s and 1960s. Nepia Mahuika argues that New Zealand history is Māori history. Whatever the subject, there is always, quote, a much broader narrative of indigenous occupation and struggle 
Therefore, all historians should draw on tikanga, Māori cultural practices, as an ethical foundation for their scholarship. Quote, to undertake ethical research, historians need to immerse themselves in the language and worldviews of the iwi kainga, local home people. He raises challenges for all those seeking to conduct oral history research ethically. It was Mahuika's work particularly that led me to reflect. For me, labor history has always been Māori history, but I'm prompted to think more deliberately about my ethical code of conduct as a researcher to enhance the kaupapa, which for me means learning how to help empower those already involved in the labor movement and those who might become so. It's about reciprocity to gain rights to collective knowledge. I have responsibilities to that collective. And it's this kind of thinking um, that has informed how labor historians involved in the trade union history project, uh, which is now goes by the name labor history project um, that um, has led to this very intersectional um, approach, I think. Well, Aroha Harris, Nipia Mahuika and I all teach oral history uh, from inside history departments. As far as I know, currently I'm the only labor historian in New Zealand who teaches New Zealand labor history from inside the university. My colleague, Jim McAloon, uh, teaches the history of class, uh, but identifies as an economic historian. This of course lines up uh, with the depletion of New Zealand historians more generally inside New Zealand universities. And remember, there are only eight universities in New Zealand to begin with. But I'm not a lonely labor historian because I'm part of a voluntary committee of archivists, trade unionists, documentary trade un filmmakers, yes, labor historians and enthusiasts um, elected to the Labor History Project Committee uh, annually. And together we continue to encourage the preservation and production of labor history as Taylor and Martin hoped for. The biennial lecture in honor of communist uh, Rona Bailey um, keeps labor history intersecting with radical history. In 2014, the Bert Roth Award in labor history was instituted and the list of recent winners demonstrates the breadth of work we consider to be New Zealand labor history. And it is quite a long list, but I'm skipping through, sorry. <laughs> we are committed to producing labor history that is useful for the trade union movement and other community groups organizing for workers' justice. Each year since 2017 uh, has seen a special themed bulletin on precarious work, pay equity and equal opportunity, winning ways, uh, documenting how um, campaigns that have won. From Kinley to the Dole Queues, workers' struggles in the 1980s, and inspired by this year's Australian conference theme, um, health and safety at work, and that bulletin is in the stages of being proofed and will be out at the end of April. These issues encourage new work to fill some of the gaps indicated by Martin and Taylor in 1991. The precarious work bulletin analyzed the experiences of all kinds of non-standard workers who are now the new norm. The pay equity and equal employment opportunity bulletin explored how racism, ableism and transphobia impacts the gender wage gap, for example. The 1980s theme brought activists from the unions and unemployed movements together to speak to that history. Toby Borrowman explores the huge mixture of formal and informal workers' dissents that occurred during the 1970s and 1980s. He employs Williams' workplace whānau concept and Ross Webb's oral history thesis work to extend his analysis to Māori and women in New Zealand freezing works. Grace Miller spoke to how clerical workers' unions enabled members to speak out and name sexual harassment in the 1980s. Jared Davison, for many years, the bulletin's designer is currently working on a book-length history of prison labour in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There is of course more work to be done. Migrant labour history, non-unionised, domestic and unpaid labour, queer and disability labour history. Despite our very small numbers, I'm hopeful for the future of intersectional labour history. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Sibel, for that um, wonderful journey through New Zealand labour history and um, Yes, a lovely, hopeful note on which to end, which is which is great. Uh, we'll move, move straight on, I think, to um, Michael's paper um, so that we can take questions at the end, unless anybody has a particular question for Sibel at this point. Um, is anybody? Uh, okay. Um, all right, well, let, let's move straight on to Michael, who's going to um, take up similar themes um, in relation to Australia and a particular group of workers. Yep. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, and 
Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, just have to take one second just to get my my screen all set up. There we go. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, echoing Diane's introduction from earlier, I would also like to acknowledge that I am presenting uh, this evening from the Kulin Nation and acknowledge the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people. Uh, and as well to acknowledge that most of my research and writing for this paper took place on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, as well as any uh, possible Aboriginal people who are joining us this evening. Um, so I'm very honoured to be uh, invited to present as part of the 60th anniversary of uh, labour history, uh, especially because at the beginning of my PhD, one of the most sort of uh, uh, most important aspects of my first year was a presentation that I gave to the uh, Canberra branch of the Labour History Society, which very much outlined what my ideas were for my PhD thesis sort of going forward. So it's quite a nice bookend in a way to be able to come back, uh, having submitted my PhD now to be able to sort of give a, a broad overview of the topic in general. Um, so my talk this evening is looking at a history of motor mechanics in Australia throughout the 20th century with a special focus on issues of class and gender. Um, so to begin with, my PhD and my, my thesis very much comes from a, a starting point of uh, the emergence of motor mechanics right at the beginning of the 20th century uh, as part of uh, sort of an emerging area of work. Motor mechanics, uh, it's a nice historical topic in a way because we can pinpoint sort of an exact starting moment with the arrival of the car in Australia, basically, well, the, the, the first imported car arrives in 19, uh, 1901. Um, so of course there is a much longer history of, of uh, the workers that are involved in the trade uh, than uh, simply just appearing in, in the 20th century. Uh, there is a long history of 19th century technical work, which combined with 20th century technology to create an entirely new area of work. Um, what is very interesting uh, is that uh, for um, the initial years of the, the trade in the area of work, it drew a wide variety of workers across class divides. There were a combination of technical workers from uh, traditional uh, metalworking trades, such as blacksmithing, who possessed an inherent knowledge of uh, technology and skills who were able to adapt to uh, working on uh, working on this new technology, but simultaneously there were elites who were buying cars, uh, who possessed a desire to, or in some cases, a simple need to know how their how their cars worked in order to keep them operational and running. Um, and with no sort of traditional industrial structures around the trade, it became a very fluid area of work. There were no limitations to who could become a mechanic, uh, not even the simple possession of knowledge and skills. Um, there was a wonderful story that I read that uh, the difference in some areas between a blacksmith and a uh, motor mechanic was quite simply changing the sign on the door. Um, and there's a wonderful uh, picture here on the left of uh, the E.W. Smith Engineering Works and Harry Robson's uh, engineers, engineering and blacksmith sort of garage, which is a, a wonderful example of this, uh, this transition between areas of work and its fluidity. Um, however, this uh, fluidity as of an area of works created long, uh, long running issues around the organization of the trade. Throughout the early years until the, uh, of the 1920s, there were very small, very short-lived unions which uh, were unable to organise workers on a large scale. And it wasn't until the establishment of the Australian branch of the Amalgamated Engineering Union in 1920 that mechanics had representation more broadly industrially. As part of this fluidity as well, there was a fluidity uh, of gender dynamics at work. 
So women have always made up a very small minority of motor mechanics as a percentage. Uh, but what has changed over time is both their opportunities to work and their acceptance within the trade more broadly. And going back uh, to the beginning of the 20th century was uh, very uh, sort of striking at how, how different women mechanics were perceived uh, 100 years ago. Um, so uh, a newspaper in Adelaide called The Register published an article in 1902 discussing their predictions that automotive work would be a natural fit for women going forward as uh, their smaller hands would be more dexterous for fitting in between uh, the tight nooks and crannies of a motor engine. Um, and this newspaper article here from 1918 talks about GM Cameron and just, uh, a motor mechanic and describes her as uh, Miss 20th century. There's very much this idea of women in these areas are sort of part of a new progressive turn in technical work. Um, and so uh, not only were women sort of perceived as a, a in, in some areas as a natural fit for motor mechanic work, but uh, garages, most notably Alice Anderson's, who's pictured here, um, who operated an all women's garage here in Melbourne, most famously, um, became sort of spaces for uh, women, but also gender diverse people um, to sort of gather and learn and have this small pocket of work within a, a, a broader sort of uh, industrial scope. And this mainly came through the benefits of the lacking or the, the lack of structure surrounding the trade more broadly. So what changed everything? Uh, the introduction of uh, formal education in the 1920s uh, through technical colleges is what I have identified as the main change uh, towards the uh, limiting of a, a fluid sort of trade area and thus limiting opportunities for both uh, uh, class mobility, but also opportunities for women. Technical uh, classes and uh, technical classes were introduced uh, throughout the late 1920s. Uh, by an agreement between uh, motorist groups, so such as uh, the NRMA or the RACV here in Victoria, and motorist employer organisations, neither of whom had mechanics best interests in heart, uh, but both were aligned in their desire to see a greater regulation of the skills in which mechanics possessed. However, prior to the 1950s, there was little effect on sort of the class makeup of mechanics, at least amongst men, uh, because certifications were not mandatory. They very much uh, uh, change from garage to garage, uh, but the uh, major garages of, uh, that were linked to employer organisations slowly rolled out a uh, only employing mechanics who possessed uh, quali uh, technical qualifications throughout the 1930s. The major effect that this had though was uh, limiting women's entry into the trade uh, as these courses were uh, specifically for men or rather there was a division between uh, men's courses and women's courses at technical colleges uh, such as what is now uh, the Working Man's College and uh, Swinburne Technical College. Um, Women's courses were much shorter than men's and also did not grant the necessary qualifications to enable work in the trade in uh, garages that were linked to employer organisations. Uh, the Second World War was a major turning point for the trade within Australian class structures. Throughout the, uh, throughout the war, uh, a massive technical up, uh, training across society enforced a, a broad sort of upskilling as over 100,000 people were trained in technical skills throughout the war. Um, for people already possessing mecha uh, technical skills, such as mechanics, uh, they were able to leverage their experience uh, throughout the war, both in military contexts and in private industry to gain uh, a sort of higher level of uh, 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 experience and, and their, uh, their skills were acknowledged and uh, uh, 
greatly uh, greatly rewarded within both uh, military and private industries. So there are stories of uh, mechanics who enlisted in the military becoming uh, both aeronautical and naval engineers, uh, as well as uh, mechanics uh, back at home in Australia who ended up becoming head aeronautical engineers uh, for both Qantas and ANSET Airlines. Um, however, as we'll come to sort of discuss a little bit later on, this was very much a short-term exploitation of circumstances rather than long-term gains for uh, mechanics within the trade itself. Um, and this sets the scene for a, a forthcoming struggle after the war within uh, the engineering sector in Australia between professionals and trade workers. The Second World War also temporarily broke the enforced gender divisions from the uh, technical uh, classes of the 1920s as the desperate need for mechanics at home to keep essential services running required the employment and training of thousands of women mechanics. Um, this as well took place as both uh, military and civilian schemes. Um, however, uh, the women who were trained in these ways were not able to keep work sort of after the Second World War, mainly due to uh, agreements struck by the Amalgamated Engineering Union and employers which protected uh, wage rates throughout the war, uh, guaranteeing women mechanics 90% uh, of the wages of men, but with an agreement that at the end of the war, uh, women mechanics would be forced out of the trade in place of returning men. Um, however, this, this structure created a problem at the end of the war because this did not happen as expected. Uh, many of the men who had left the trade at the end of the Second World War uh, didn't return. They leveraged their new skills and experiences to transfer into other areas of, of engineering, especially into uh, what would become the emerging professional areas of engineering. And so uh, this sort of forms the, the background to uh, a long running dispute over the professionalization of engineering throughout the 1950s and 1960s, uh, which I've discussed in part with an article uh, that I helped co-write with Hannah Forsyth that was published in Labor History last year. Um, and the key change uh, in uh, the key change that this resulted for mechanics was an increasing isolation from the professional, the increasingly professionalized area of engineering. Uh, as engineers professionalized through a uh, work value case that uh, concluded at the end of the 1950s, there was an increasing uh, sort of refusal to acknowledge the skills and uh, refusal to acknowledge the knowledge and skills that mechanics possessed and other uh, technical workers possessed uh, to enter into areas of engineering. And so this provided quite a radical change to the structure of engineering in Australia, which had long drawn upon technical workers as a very important labor force for uh, filling out the, uh, the, the industry more broadly. Um, and stifled areas of career development that had greatly benefited technical workers throughout the Second World War and to its immediate end. Um, so with this rolling back of uh, this rolling back of the immediate benefits that some mechanics enjoyed at the end of the Second World War, mainly came down to the inability of mechanics to organise a structured resistance uh, to the key operators of the trade, which, as identified earlier, were the motorist organisations and uh, uh, motorists and the employer groups. Um, I've identified two sort of major uh, exceptions to this. Um, one came through uh, unionised structures and the other through just individual acts of resistance. Um, 
Notably in New South Wales, uh, mechanics who uh, worked within the public service, mainly within uh, uh, bus companies, were highly unionised, uh, linking in with uh, sort of broader uh, public transport unions and became a uh, major source of resistance to changes within the 1950s in the public sector. Um, mechanics were sort of a leading source of multiple strikes throughout the early to mid 1950s, uh, which uh, were, had varying degrees of success uh, in attaining sort of uh, attaining resistance to uh, attempts to change uh, uh, to, to either lower wages or stifle wages and conditions. Um, however, for the majority of mechanics working out of garages, they lacked any uh, sort of collective resources to draw upon uh, to mount any sort of resistance to ongoing changes within the trade. However, uh, the main sort of form of individual action that I've sort of identified as a common resistance tactic that took place throughout Australia was the art of what was called backyarding or backyard work. And the ideal with, it, with this was that uh, individual workers would entice uh, customers to come to their house sort of after hours or on the weekend and would do private work uh, sort of circumnavigating the, uh, the, the employer and using them as sort of a, a middleman. So uh, this sort of acted as a way of uh, regulating both uh, prices and wages. Um, however, it's uh, very much sort of a, an individualised tactic localised in uh, or set in, in small local areas uh, that did not have the ability to uh, enforce any sort of wide level structural change. Um, and a core sort of uh, sub note at this point as well is very much the uh, cultural changes in forms of mass automobility which occurred throughout the 1950s drastically changed how society viewed the car as well. Previously, mechanics were able to benefit from the links which uh, the technology had with a very small group of elites who were able to afford the car. Um, but with uh, the expansion of mass production, Australian uh, production of, of cars as well through Holden uh, throughout the 1950s, there's very much this sort of changing of, of social status. Uh, they were sort of now viewed as an essential part of everyday life. Uh, but lost that sort of connection with, with elite status that they had possessed prior to the Second World War. Um, and so these cultural changes, as long, along with this uh, sort of industrial embedding of, of processes, assisted in embedding automotive work amongst sort of amongst hegemonic masculinity towards the end of the 1950s, creating the sort of ideal that we understand of, of mechanics now as a uh, very much a masculinized trade. I think the last statistics I saw were that 99% of all mechanics in Australia are men. Um, and that uh, more so than, than just simply the numbers, but there's very much a, a culture of hostility towards women workers. Um, and this is something that I've sort of identified as very much come across through uh, these sort of 1950s cultural changes. Feminist resistance movements in the 1970s, such as the Give a Girl a Stana movement, encouraged women to take up trades, uh, including working as motor mechanics, as a way of sort of pushing back and resisting uh, the uh, exclusion of women from certain areas of work. However, these gendered structures had become completely embedded both within employers and workers and male workers alike. Um, and so while challenging, it's, it's very important to note this did not deter all women workers. Um, there's a wonderful picture here of Judy Siddons, who uh, is an exceptional example of a uh, mechanic, not only because uh, she was a woman, but also because she was a, a union leader in Western Australia as well. Um, but very much sort of the, uh, the, the outlier. Um, and so I guess where I'd like to finish my, my talk off uh, today 
is with this wonderful photographic series that I sort of found throughout my research uh, from Dean Safran, uh, who uh, uh, did this photograph of a hundred year old garage in uh, Nunda, Queensland back in 2015. And I love this photographic series because it really does capture that sort of cultural image that we possess of the motor mechanic as this sort of worn male worker, the grease and grime of the garage and uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, I should have given names here. The, the name of the mechanic who's photographed here is Bill Russell and his wife who very much works as a, the front counter worker, uh, Marilyn. Um, sort of links in with this broader cultural image that we possess of mechanics today um, and has this sort of sense of timelessness to it. Um, but what I hope that I've demonstrated in my talk and, and also in my thesis more broadly is that this is very much not the case. Um, it's an illusion of history and that this sort of common perception uh, in fact runs sort of counter to long running tensions within the trade that sort of develop from its fluid origins, origins uh, into this corralling of the trade into this uh, one restricted area of work uh, which throughout history has challenged both class and gender dimensions. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michael, for that uh, wonderful insight into um, the complexity, but also the historical events, changes, times that denaturalizes what seems so obvious or natural in terms of gender and class and so on. So. Yeah, really great. And what I love about these two papers is also the way they're emphasizing the methodology of oral history. And in Michael's case, um, the note we finished on is the, the important imagery, the visualization, to visualize this work. Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to jump in first by just sort of acknowledging um, that uh, my thesis project had very sort of similar links with uh, what Sybil was talking about earlier in terms of uh, oral history in capturing that history within the margins. Um, oral history was uh, very essential with my thesis in sort of uh, one, one of the few times where I could actually hear sort of the, the voices of workers themselves that were captured throughout a number of oral history projects, usually relating to either the First or Second World War, but also some uh, projects that were run in terms of just sort of uh, life and experience uh, throughout uh, a number of uh, uh, towns and, and also industries more broadly. Um, and so I think to the, the level of detail I was able to provide in my thesis and, and parts of this presentation, I never would have been able to achieve without, uh, without oral histories. They're incredibly valued to the work that we do as labor historians. Mm, thanks. Frank, that looks like you've got a hand up. It is, it is a hand. Uh, thanks, Stone. Um, Sybil, could I ask a, a little bit about the, the kind of archival scene in New Zealand? I mean, um, which I don't know. Um, in Australia, I guess we, we've been fortunate in having a number of labour archives and, and I guess notably, you know, the, the Noel Butlin archives, also massive labour archive at the University of Melbourne, but a number of others as well in, in other centres. And I'm just wondering uh, how New Zealand has been served through things like trade union records and other organisational and institutional um, uh, records. And, and perhaps, yeah, I, I guess the other question would also be about arbitration records too, which have been used in Australia quite widely for, for, for various forms of, of labour history. Yeah, um, thanks, Frank. Good, great question. Hey, hey, Grace, feel free to, to jump in and join me um, <laughs> on these questions. Um, so the Labour History Project, we don't have our own archive. Okay, that's been one of, you know, that's the thing to put out there. But what has tended to happen is that um, beginning with the enormous collection of Bert Roth, who, um, you know, from inside the Auckland Library collected absolutely everything he could possibly ever get his hands on. It's kind of formed the kernel of the big collection uh, in the Alexander Turnbull Library. 
um, but also the National Library part of that library as well has all of the new union newspapers. And so that's become the place that people have taken their trade union records to. So, so, mm -hmm. so you know, having that in Wellington is a, is a fantastic um, gift, really. Um, but it is amongst everything else, um, if you know what I mean. It's not, we don't have our own special collection. Um, yeah. Grace, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Um, no, not really, except that there are bits and pieces. There was quite a good, um, there's called Words at Work, like a, a bibliography of archival collection. And so there are bits and pieces in all sorts of other 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 libraries. So you do have to kind of, um, you know, you, you can have to travel around to find very different things in, in, in different places. And I don't think, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think, and maybe this is something we should, I don't know quite how we do it, think about with the Labour History Project, but um, I don't think uh, current archiving of union records is a particularly high concern for the uh, union movement. So I, I'm not sure that more recent material is, is being archived um, either, which is, you know, is a lot of very important material there. Hmm. Yeah, so in order to get all of, for example, just to follow up on that, to get help my hands on all of the um, National Distribution Union records um, and then into First Union, that was when I've been writing my history of Bill Anderson, um, involved going to a storage lockup and, um, and knowing the right people to um, get them to <laughs> go box load after box load mm -hmm. uh, but they did find me um bill anderson's um effects that were in his desk um when he died so um yeah, yeah. roth sounds a little bit like uh, in his collecting a little bit like the role that was played in victoria anyway by sam merrifield uh, mm -hmm. uh again an incredibly massive and miscellaneous collection of labour history materials um, mm. that, that have been used for, for decades, really. Um, mm. Uh, mm. But um, yeah, it, it does sound a little like that. Thank you. Yeah, and being in um, Wellington and the Alexander Turnbull Library is all very well until you have one of your earthquakes. <laughs> and then uh, it gets shut down. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, Braden, I can see your hand up. Yes. Um, thanks, Diane, and thanks to both the uh, speakers for uh, really fascinating presentations um, with lots of food for thought in both cases. Sabila, if I may, it's lovely to see you again. <laughs> uh, and um, seeing you reminds me of a kind of a lead into my question, which I wanted to ask, which follows a bit from what Frank was saying. Uh, mm. I was really struck by the, as I have been for a long time, by, to an outsider, the vitality of uh, labour history in New Zealand with what, you know, the work that you took us through there and something that I was uh, struck by in, in listening to you was, uh, as you said, the connections between <laughs> the few uh, self-identifying labour historians in the academy and a much wider network, um, which is obviously very powerful. And I remember Verity's now here, I see. I remember Verity making a similar point that a lot of labour history might be, should be, was <laughs> coming from outside the university system. Mm. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you was, um, to what extent you think there is or could be a formal uh, set of connections between the um, either the peak bodies or individual trade unions in New Zealand and um, uh, labour historians. I get the sense from what you were saying that there's perhaps not as much of that as it used to be. Um, yeah, when I first when I first moved back from the states in uh, 2012. Um, yeah, so when I was first reconnecting um, with people in the trade union movements, um, Ross Teppett, who's actually on our Labour History Project committee, is a key education person at the Council of Trade Unions. And mm -hmm. so he does all the education work with emerging trade union leaders. And so he has got, for a number of years, um, he was getting me into to, to, to 
explore the history <laughs> with with trade union leaders and then also Mark Darby as well actually did some of that work mm. um which then meant that um I ended up being invited to go and speak at union conferences as well um yeah so more often than not women's conferences but um, you right. might be surprised to know but um <laughs> but so so building those connections and you know Grace was very much with me we were kind of made a decision that we needed to to reach out and and talk to trade unionists and say what are the issues that you care about what issues do you want us to be connecting from the past into the living moment mm -hmm. and so yeah grace was, was it you started that i think it was yeah we did some we we went along to the um while i was chair we went along to the um the uh, um National Affiliates Council meeting and kind of got more affiliate members and things like that. But I mean, I think one of the things about New Zealand is it is so small that formal <laughs> and informal connections kind of blur together really right. easily. Yeah. Um, so, um, but the other, the other, the other thing is that there's probably quite an opportunity at the moment for more uh, because they're introducing fair pay agreements, which is a kind of um, watered down version of awards and I think that there's a there's a lot of knowledge even within the trade union movement that most people who negotiated awards or knew anything about awards they're no longer um you know most of them are retired a lot aren't still are still around and so like there, there will be a real turning to history um mm -hmm. in order to figure out how to kind of take advantage of that so that's yeah mm -hmm. something that I've been thinking about um what we can do there yeah. Thanks, Grace. Just to follow up, Grace. Um, yeah, so I, I have been approached by um, Andrew Schick about um, and perhaps maybe making some little videos or something to help with that kind of training. So it is definitely something we could have a chat about. Okay, um, are there any other, yeah, Frank has a follow up question. Yeah, I'll call last one for Michael if no one else uh, uh, wants to, to step yeah. in first. Um, Michael, I wondered, um, I mean, obviously you've, you've been working with Hannah who I see is, is here and have collaborated with her. And I, I wonder if you had any reflections on um, comparisons with with other professions actually the dynamics that you've you've identified with the mechanics and whether um and in relation to engineering more broadly um whether um you know th there are comp you know, professions that are, have um or trades and professions that have been comparable in terms of the kinds of issues that you've you've identified with with your group um so i guess my, my question is kind of you know um how typical really is, is the experience that you identified in, in, in I mean you've obviously pointed to a number of ways in which it's kind of unusual the technology itself is is, is basically a 20th century uh, and beyond technology but I'm, I'm just wondering more generally whether um, there, there were some others that you noticed that perhaps had a, a similar sort of dynamic. Yeah sure thank you very much Frank um, really good question I think uh, the experience of engineers in Australia is quite sort of unique in amongst the professions. Um, and I sort of tread lightly here without stepping on Hannah's toes in terms of <laughs> the, the history of professions. Um, I, I think there's certainly some uh, relation to the more uh, metalworking trades more broadly um, in terms of their relationship with engineering. Um, I mean, I'm not too sure about the, the specific dynamics, um, but certainly more broadly in terms of uh, uh, the sort of metalworking and, and, and technical engineering trades, I think there is a similar process that's occurred of both uh, both sort of de-skilling and specialisation, which is two uh, key factors that I, I, I didn't sort of touch on in, the, in my presentation today, but, but do go into quite detail on in the thesis itself. Um, 
I, th- I, I would certainly be interested to see um, and can't wait to read Hannah's book to see more broadly about uh, connections with uh, professions more broadly and, and how much the sort of uh, lessons that I've learned from or that, that I've and connections I've been drawing th- from my thesis could be drawn to other uh, other relationships between uh, technical uh, uh, sort of trades and professions more broadly. Um, actually, the, the, while I was saying that, I sort of my brain started because I uh, did think that um, I know that there, there is a similar experience that's occurred within uh, the uh, within the aeronautical industry between sort of uh, uh, engineering maintenance workers and uh, sort of engineers and, and aeronautical engineers, uh, which again sort of ties into the connection with mechanics as well, because one of the things throughout the, uh, especially through the Second World War is very much the acknowledgement of transferability of skills between uh, people working on cars and people working on planes. Um, obviously, as technology has gotten more complicated, that has sort of uh, complicates the relationship but that sort of base level of skill and and sort of you know transferability of of, of uh, knowledge is is still there. What has changed is very much the social connection and class dynamics. Mm. Yeah, I mean the ones that sprang to mind, Michael, would be I, I suppose um, chemicals would be one. I, I wondered um, another mm. you know almost identical in some ways with the, the yeah. chronology or yeah. period of of your. your um, motor cars and I suppose the other is um, um, metallurgy and, and I, I wondered about that one but you know they're just ones that spring to mind yeah yeah I, I was struck Michael by the point you were making about the who controlled the decision making and the entry to the trade and unusually you were talking about um, consumer organisations like the NRMA and the RACV rather than the employers or the bosses or whatever. Um, And also that control of education and formal education, because in some instances, it's access to formal education that enables women to enter occupations because they're not having to learn on the job or, you know, um, from people, other people who are controlling it. So, um, I think the way you've you've identified um, who's in control at any particular point and moment, uh, that was really significant. I thought, yeah, yeah. So um, it's certainly a very unique dynamic within uh, sort of the Australian environment, and speaks to that uh, sort of elite connection. Uh, I think the the one one of the main ways that motorist organisations, especially, are able to gain so much power over the industry is that it is very much an extension of already co- uh, elite collections of society. Um, and they formed so early, the, the RAs, uh, most sort of Eastern seaboard uh, motor mecha- uh, uh, motorist organisations are founded by 1903 or 1905. So it's very much an extension of uh, sort of existing connections amongst elites. Mm. Um, they, they change, obviously, you, know, you you see uh, these organisations today, they are completely different to, to that. Uh, and that's sort of part of the transformation of mass automobility as it occurs within the, the 1940s and 1950s. Um, but where these organisations gain so much power is because they are able to organise so early and they already have these existing connections, they are able to make claims to uh, control over an industry uh, without lacking the sort of technical knowledge or process to be able to do so. Um, and so one of the first things that they try and do and, and do successfully do sort of throughout the, the 1920s and 30s is employ mechanics under their umbrella. Initially, they try and bring mechanics in as sort of uh, almost like a representative organisation. They almost want to serve as a union of mechanics, um, but they're very much rebuffed by individual mechanics. Um, and so instead they sort of take the route of one, employing mechanics directly, and two, uh, they leverage their status to create relationships with technical colleges and uh, employ a number of skilled technical advisors 
uh, to uh, serve as sort of creators of curriculum. It's very interesting as well. One of the things that I noted in my review of the sort of uh, journals of motorist organisations is that there's this, this constant tension between uh, defending the status of uh, mechanics who are employed by those organisations as the, the sort of the, the elite of mechanics uh, and, and trying to protect their status, uh, which then has the effect of uh, uh, it makes mechanics within those organisations uh, uh, sort of ripe for the picking for unions. And so the main unionised mechanics outside of uh, the public service are very much mechanics that work for motorist organisations. Mm. Mm, very interesting. Well, um, do we have any other questions? Is anybody I'm overlooking? Um, if not, I uh, I think we'll just um, endorse Julie Kimber's comment in the chat, which is terrific presentations. Thank you so much to you both. That's been a fantastic um, evening and um, lovely to hear you both talk about and, and show um, how much is wonderful work is going on with labour history. So um, we will meet again um, in May um, when we'll hear another two papers. Um, so great work, both of you. Thanks very much. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming along. That's great.